Three, two, one. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, boys and berries, this is Magic Brad on The Magic Brad Show, formerly Synergy Cafe, but uh, maybe we'll re resurrect that someday. So this is fun. I've got a friend, uh, a new friend online. He's from the Netherlands, and his name is Dimitri, and I'm going to shoot the last name, Body a Roll. Well done. Well oh, done, Brad. Yes. Yes. Brilliant. I don't use my last name because it's it's pronounced Goodum. That's the way I pronounce it. It's spelled G-U-D-I-M. And some people say, is that Goodium? And it's no I was wondering. Indeed, I was wondering how to pronounce that name. Goodum. Yeah. yeah. What I don't is the even know of that name. Huh? What is the origin of your name? It sounds I think quite it's Norwegian. unusual. I think it's Norwegian. I, th I think Norwegian. I've seen it uh, G-U-I-D-I-U-M. Goodium. Yes. Yeah. Maybe? Yeah. Wonderful. So, wow. <laughs> names. Yeah. Names yeah, I thought words. there's something, there's something from the Vikings, from the Celts, <laughs> something, something very Nordic and inspiring. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm from Minnesota, which has got a lot of Norwegian and the Minnesota Vikings is our American football team. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So we're going to talk today about music and I see the violins behind you. Um, when I saw this, I was very interested in it because I just started turning lay, uh, wood on a lathe. This is a magic coin box that uh, magicians use to make coins disappear. And I made this myself. Okay. Kind of like what wow. you do, but um, I think your skills require much more. Um, you need to really know. It, it's fascinating because I've watched some videos on make you make violins from hand. Yes, uh, just like you are making your magic boxes, I make violins by hand. So in a way, it is a box. Yeah. Uh, just a little bit more parts to it, maybe. But otherwise, Definitely. it's exactly the same thing as yours. <laughs> well, there's a friend of ours that um, he's a guitar musician. And uh, like I said, I live in Minnesota and Minnesota borders Lake Superior which is a large, one of the great lakes here in, in the United States. And um, he has a friend that makes his guitars and some of his guitars were actually from wood that was extracted and found in Lake Superior. Wow. And the, the, he, he was tell some stories when he's doing his concerts and things about how the guy That's makes. very interesting. So you have to actually, I mean, there, there's gotta be a lot in that. How do you know what it's gonna sound like before before you make it. Yeah, that's a wonderful question, Brad. Um, I will try to find a way to answer it in a simple way. So I guess it's a design. So there is a lot of design and um, the concept of the sound is actually integrated in the design of the instrument. That's one of the most important things is maybe not the most important thing, how the instrument is designed. And um, the next component, important component, I guess, is the wood, the choice of the wood. And it is not so much the choice of species of the wood, but yeah, this is important, of course, but also how you match the two different pieces of the wood so that they form a musical instrument because it's, it's, it's quite subtle. And um, I guess the third element that contributes in a good sound or great sound in the instrument is experience because now you have that design experience, you know how to design instruments, and you know how to get the sound with total certainty. Now you have experience as a craftsman and you know how to marry two pieces of wood together. Um, so that's, um, that's, I guess, how you create those instruments. So the density of the wood matters, the curvature of the wood, because the sound is bouncing around inside of the, the violin. The, yes. The and then the, the joining, you got to make sure when these pieces are glued together, it's probably the type of glue too, or that Make sure because if it wasn't matched together, it's gonna be a weird vibration. If it true. Wasn't, yes, know. true. Yeah, it's very interesting. You mentioned the word uh, density and blue and all these things. Uh, they are definitely all important and they do contribute into the sound of the instrument. What I find, um, and I've learned that from some antique instruments, for example, I have had in my hands um, extraordinary instruments such as um, made by Antonio Stradivari or Guarneri del Gesso and, and a huge number of other Italian instrument makers, uh, instruments from the 17th and 18th century. And when you, when you hold those instruments in your hands, you notice, uh, inevitably you notice that 
all, all be, they are all very different in terms of design or the model, the arching, wood density. There is one thing, something common between all of them. Speaking about schools of instrument making, like Italian or French or German. So there is one unifying aesthetic, one penetrating um, overall idea in those instruments, which dominates. And although the instruments may be very different, even from the same maker, they can be very different. There is one, this big global idea that governs the whole thing. And I, I believe that this is the most important thing, is that the fundamental idea inside of the, the foundation, the philosophical idea in the instrument, which is, uh, which is even more important, I believe, than uh, density or materials used. Uh, although I 100% agree with you, what, what you, you mentioned about the, the glue or the density, those things are, of course, very important. And how I came to this idea, if you were to ask, um, now there was this uh, incredible Antonio Stradivari, and probably pictures of this instrument are actually all over the place on the internet. So it's very badly damaged. And it has cleats on top of cleats, tons of cracks, uh, not very well restored. And that instrument still sounds absolutely incredible. You see what I mean? So it's like. So what, what's, it, what's the one thing? You're very good at dragging this on, and you got me on the edge of my seat here. What is this one commonality? <laughs> that's, that's one commonality is that uh, philosophical idea within that instrument, those instruments. Now, so it's like a proportional design in those instruments, something very robust and based on thousands of years of tradition. So I, what, what I'm speaking exactly about, I'm speaking about the, the harmonical proportion as were discovered by the ancient Greeks. Those harmonical proportions, you see what I mean? Uh, they were used by the ancient Greek architects to design perfectly sounding theaters. And there is actually a Roman architect, uh, sixth century before Christ, who writes uh, a book, 10 books on architecture. So it's actually like one of the oldest books, if not the oldest known book on architecture, more than 2000 years old. And this book uh, happened to be the, one of the most influential treatises on <clears throat> on architecture has been translated uh, throughout the century in all of the languages, Arabic and all languages in Europe, and has been studied uh, widely by artists and architects and, and so on. So there is one book, I believe it's number five or six, I don't remember exactly which number. It's one book, whole book dedicated to the harmonical proportions and how you build beautifully sounding theaters with total certainty. So beautiful chapter, a little bit confusing because you need to be familiar with the ancient Greek musical theory to understand kind of this. Like, like the golden mean in the Nautilus? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Ah. Yeah, yeah. Th this is a very interesting uh, thing as well. You can integrate the golden mean within the design of instruments. I knew it. Uh, um, uh, however, according to Vitruvius, that, uh, he writes in that book, as clear as that, these are the laws. So he describes the laws of the harmonics. Yeah, it's a division of the vibra vibrating bodies and how you use this in constructing a theater. Now he writes, these are the laws used by the skilled workmen who fashion musical instruments in order to bring them to the perfection of their proper concords. More or less uh, precise uh, quotation. So this was like, wow, this was yeah. uh, such a clear instruction to me. Uh, 28 years ago, when I came across for the first time uh, with that sentence, with that um, with that phrase, sorry, uh, that I decided to um, just dig deeper and find out about, about those harmonical proportions that were used by the skilled workmen who fashion musical instruments. Wow. That's how I came to this. So it's not just cutting out the hourglass shape and putting a couple of veneers on the sides and making a box and boom, you got it. There's a lot more to it. How, how long does it take you? from the beginning to the end to make an, in, uh, an instrument? Uh, that depends. That's between um, you know, five weeks to, uh, which is one month and one week intensively. Uh, that is probably the quickest I can uh, have it done. Uh, but more typically it takes between two and three months. Wow. And that's regular work day too, right? You know, yeah, yeah, all yeah. day long. Yeah, I can yeah, imagine exactly. you've got to shave the inside and it's got to be the proper thickness. And if you come into a, a natural wood blemish, you need to fix that somehow. 
Exactly. Absolutely, wow. absolutely right. Yeah. I bet a lot of people don't really think about that when they say, I'm going to take violin and they go on to Amazon and they order one. They don't really think about all well, that. There's nothing wrong with Amazon violins. <laughs> <laughs> it really depends on what a musician wants to get from, from the instrument. If it's just for fun, <clears throat> excuse me, if it's just for fun, why not? I know. Sure. Yeah, similar uh, most art, I guess, the basics. But when you get into yeah. the, the, yeah. when you start really being a critic and <laughs> expert, yeah, you're right. Um, yeah, it's like you, you can buy an art print from Amazon or you can buy an art print from an artist. Depends what you yep. want. And there's always a story behind the art too, because you can take a print and it's just a bunch of knockoffs. But if you got the story and the corner is torn off because somebody in, the, in BC Times ripped it off to make a note or something, if there's a yeah. story. In. I've got a friend that uh, collects a lot of magic memorabilia. So he's got some things that are like letters that were written from Houdini to other magicians and things. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's things like that. You see an old violin, you find out that uh, someone from thousands of years ago made it and oh my God, who owns that? And yeah, don't break it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting that we mentioned the, the word story and I, I believe it is so important um, that there is a story of some kind in anything or we do in us, in, in, in the musicians, in the artists, there's always a story. And that's always a fascinating story. What type I of find. wood is it generally made of? Like a hardwood, like a walnut or a mahogany or what type of wood? Um, yeah, hardwood uh, such as mahogany and stuff like that would be used for guitars, I guess. I, I'm not a guitar expert. I don't build guitars. So in violins, it is spruce for the top and um, maple, typically it's maple for the sides, for the back of the instrument, for the neck with the scroll. And um, if it is a modern violin uh, for a classical, so to speak, violin, then the fingerboard will typically be made of ebony. And if it is a Baroque instrument uh, built in the style of the 17th or 18th century, it could be um, local uh, European hardwoods, or it could be composite uh, fingerboard made from spruce and maple on the sides and covered with hardwood veneer on top you know, to protect it against well, the strings. And as a traditionalist, because it seems like you are, uh, what do you think of those more electronic type, like what Bond uses? You know, the musician, the female musician's Bond? That is a very interesting question. I believe um, uh, I'm very interested in all kinds of instruments, uh, including modern instruments and um, experimental instruments. So uh, this is very interesting area of uh, research and uh, tradition and culture for myself. I believe, yeah, <laughs> if I were to if I were to dive into modern instruments. Potentially, I would try to um, see and experiment how I could create those uh, brand new concepts and brand new designs, but still connect them with thousands of years of tradition of yes, culture. I, I agree. You need the origin. Yeah, yeah. Actually, origin. Exactly. That's the that's the, the, the that's the key word. Uh, if you, uh, there is this book. Um, I really love that book very much. It's a story of art. And, um, and uh, in that story of art, it's a giant, giant volume. Um, actually, it's, it's so, so great book that I have actually uh, two volumes, one for myself and one to lend to my students when they want to read. If they don't have one, they are not ready to buy one, whatever. So um, in, in, in that um, uh, history of art, um, when you go through this, you discover that all of the instru uh, instrument makers, sorry, all of the artists uh, who left a trace of some kind in arts, they bend the rules in one or another way. They raise new answers, so offered new, um, uh, raise new questions, maybe new, uh, offered new answers. Yeah. But all, all of them were very intimately familiar with the with the foundations with the tradition yeah. just then they might break all the instead. rules yes foundation. yeah yeah that's what i would be doing i guess if i were into um, contemporary uh, music even uh, music instruments even if it were like the, the stuff they play in the star wars movies yeah absolutely yeah lovely yeah absolutely 
So like cin cinematic instruments, something like, yeah. I keep yeah. these kind of short so people can consume it all, but I want to also find out where, who is your market? Is, are you global as far as you'll make an instrument from anybody, for anybody anywhere on the planet? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, we are living in a global world. So um, I have, um, my target market is uh, our professional musicians. So uh, that's my that's main uh, group of people I'm, uh, I'm serving. And um, I believe that a great instrument maker needs to, uh, to create an instrument in such a way that it enables the musician, uh, each individual musician to fulfill their aspirations, artistic, personal, uh, musical aspirations. So this is what the instruments are for. And yes, absolutely targeting globally. Absolutely. Well, there, there's something to be said for uh, like if you're creating a, a, an instrument for the individual musician rather than just buying it, off, you know, uh, one off the shelf, so to speak, like like these boxes, these coin boxes, I'm making them for the individual performers. So there's, mm. there's you know, only one of these in the whole world, just like your violins. There's wow. only one of each one. Right. It's not on an assembly line kind of thing. Yeah. Your, your whole day is like this is the instrument I'm making for John. Yeah. And it's, there's a match to it. Kind of like my friend, Michael Monroe. His, he, he has names for his instruments. He's got a series of guitars, beautiful. And they're all specially made for him as a musician. And they're, they're his, they're him. That's very interesting. <laughs> so these magical uh, magic boxes that you are creating, they are designed for individual, for a specific performer hand the size of the hand or how does it work a little bit of that and then also this one like has a little knob on it this is unusual normally they don't have a little little knob on top oh yeah yeah so the, the the look of it um yes. and sometimes if you just buy them like off the shelf so to speak people see that and go oh that's one of those boxes that those magicians use this okay. is a different kind of box you could say it's like a pill box so you can have a story behind it you can also get into doing certain things with them so that there's a little magical secrets that I can't explain at this time. <laughs> or you can pull a rabbit out of that box. You never know what you can pull out <laughs> of that know, box. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. there's a certain weight to it to do certain things that you have to do. And the, yeah. the size, yeah. the, the lid has to be able to come off. It can't, it can't turn off. It's got to just fall off. Get so there's it. a lot of things. That's, that's, a, that's a lot of things and lots of uh, subtleties. I'm somewhat familiar with this because uh, with magic, uh, because when I was a kid, I was uh, learning how to do magic tricks. And I remember that you know, the, the size of the coins had to be exact for my palm and yeah. uh, the balls that I were playing with, like, you know, like magic balls to do all kinds of tricks with them. They had to also fit my hand because otherwise it would be very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. And uh, what a lot of people don't realize with the magic is the the work is behind the scenes. It just looks like you put a coin into your hand, but they don't realize all the work to make it look that way because that's not what really happened. It's, yeah. I've seen like um, very good musicians, they start playing and there's another sound other than what they're doing. Somehow there's another sound happening because of the acoustics. The, what is that? Um, I forgot what it's called, like a harmonious distortion or something like that. A third Probably. sound yeah. comes out of something somehow yeah 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 i'm not very musically inclined for some reason it doesn't work for me I, I, I find it fascinating with all these different strings and i'm assuming when you're playing the violin it matters whether you're in the center of the bowl or the ends of the bowl or the the angle that you're going at and where how the pressure on strings yeah very complicated it's amazing <laughs> and yet right. there's only seven notes <laughs> yes <laughs> Well, Dimitri, this has been fascinating talking with you about Lovely. this. How do people get a hold of you if they go, you know what? I like that guy. I want to have my violin made from this gentleman. How do I am all over the place. They can simply uh, Google my name and uh, find my uh, website on Google. They can go directly to my website, badiarovviolence.com. They can find me on Facebook, on Instagram. I'm everywhere, literally. Got it. That, that's how I tell people too, because that's what they're going to do anyways. They're not going to remember a domain name. Although I will yeah. find your information. I'll put it on YouTube and link it into the, the blogs I, that I, I put out there because it makes it a little easier just to click rather than trying to figure it out. Of course. And I will also share it everywhere. 
Well, wonderful. Well, Dimitri, I appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. And I will uh, zoom this up to the internet and we'll get working on it. Probably take about an hour because I work kind of fast. If you want to stay on, we can have a little chat. Other than that, I'm going to stop the recording and beam this out to the universe. Appreciate you taking the time. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful, Brad. It was uh, such a, a smooth show. You are such a pro in this. Wow. Thank Tell you. me, since how long um, you have podcast? I've been doing this specific podcast probably for about seven years. Seven years. Yes. Wow. That so, is. Let me uh, stop the recording. Appreciate your time, Dimitri. <laughs>